Hello again. Welcome everyone to week 10 of the ABCD ReproNim course. Uh, a couple announcements quick before we start uh, and start introducing folks. Uh, please submit your project week proposals, everyone. That's coming up soon and we want to get everyone excited and uh, paying attention to what they're going to be doing. We invite you to use the lectures in this week you know, to think hard about what kind of project you'd like to do for project week. The deadline to submit your pro proposal will be February 12th. That's next week. So uh, think and submit. Now, again, we don't have to submit, but the more ideas we can have ahead of time, that just helps people think about what, to, what they want to do and how to work together in the best possible way. So by way of introductions, I'd like to uh, say hello to Kara Baggett. And you can introduce yourself you know, quickly you know, for right now. Hi all, um, my name is Cara Baggett. Um, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and, and looking forward to um, answering all your questions today. Thanks. Great, thank you. And our other uh, presenter is Yarek Halchenko. Yarek, say hello. Hi, I'm Yaroslav Alevich Halchenko from Dartmouth College, doing some neuroimaging and software development on spare time. Right. Somehow that name sounded so different when he said it than when I did. But anyway, welcome to both of you. Uh, the lectures that you hopefully have seen already is on the ABCD novel technologies and uh, ReproMan, the Re ReproNim reproducible software management execution stuff that Yarek talked about. Anyway, so I'll turn uh, more introductions over to Angie. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to week 10. We've got a fun discussion lined up for you today. And moderating today will be our TA, Dustin Morcheski. Dustin, say hi. Hello, I'm Dustin. Good job pronouncing that. Um, I am a data scientist contractor for the NIMH, and I'm excited to, to moderate this discussion. I'm going to throw things over to Jessica for some final announcements before we get started. Hey everybody, just before we get started, a few course related announcements. One clarification about the email um, that we sent out uh, this week to enrolled students. Uh, sorry, I got a little confused. The um, project week registration assignment that um, I announced in that email is actually redundant. The one that you should fill out in Canvas is called ABCD data access slash duck status survey. That's the one where um, you uh, tell us basically whether or not you have your duck and whether or not you plan to participate in project week. So um, I'll be removing the project week registration assignment um, shortly after this. Um, this Zoom, but I uh, just wanted to clarify that. Sorry for the uh, confusion. Make sure, um, please, to if you're an enrolled student and you do plan on participating in Project Week, um, please fill out the ABCD data access slash duck status survey so that we know um, who's participating and we can get a headcount um, to plan appropriately. Um, another announcement for observer students. We have sent out invitations to active observer students um, to participate in Project Week. Uh, we defined active here as having completed six or more data exercises as of last week. So if you got an email from us and you want to take part in Project Week, please complete um, the uh, observer registration form linked to in that email. And if you did not get an email from us, but you believe you should have, please reach out and we'll see what happened with that. Um, last announcement, announcement from me, we're performing some super brief maintenance on the Jupiter Hub um, this afternoon, uh, which means it'll be down temporarily. We're just updating some soft software um, uh, so that UKs can do the homework from this week and also just add some stuff in preparation for project week. So it should be uh, up again soon thereafter, but uh, around this evening, we're gonna unfortunately have to kick everyone off of the hub, um, but it should it should be a pretty quick update. Um, and that's all the announcements for me. So let's get started with some of the questions that you guys have submitted. All right, so I'm gonna start things off by asking an ABCD question to Kara. Um, so you did a great job in your lecture kind of characterizing the pilot data for the Fitbit and the EARS app and there are some questions about the, the nature of the full sample, what that looks like now, what it looks like going forward. So mm -hmm. first question about that. Um, I understand that about 150 participants participated in Fitbit and EARS aspects of the study at baseline in year two follow-up. What are the future plans for the further study? Is the goal for as many participants to provide these data as possible or will the sample stay around 150? 
Yeah, so, so the goal is to generalize it to the entire um, sample. Again, it's only for Android phones. Um, so it won't be the, the nearly 12,000 kids that are in the entire um, ABCD sample. It will likely stay at about a quarter of those, of those kids, so maybe about 4,000. Um, but we do expect as, as these kids age, um, more and more will have smartphones. So at, at this time point, a, a little less than 40% actually didn't even own a smartphone. Um, and so we, we expect those numbers to sort of change as these kids get older. And then we should see a greater number of the overall population in ABCD um, with smartphones that can contribute to this ears sub-study. Sub Thanks. Is it part of the protocol um, as kids come in for different visits to ask if their technology status has updated? Yes, so um, it is part of the pro protocol. Um, so to ask them if they have a smartphone and what kind of phone they have. Um, we also ask if they have like an iPad um, and especially with COVID now, um, there are a lot of technology sort of related questions to see sort of what devices they have, how, how, they, um, how often they access those devices and things like that. Okay, and you also kind of touched on the answer to this question, but the question is, it's unfortunate that the EARS app cannot be used with iPhones. I know that only 23% of the subjects in the pilot had Android phones. What percentage of subjects in the full study are being tracked with the EARS app? And for what it sounds like, um, you estimate that about the same percentage of the full sample is the same? Yeah, at, at, at this point, um, and that's only because like the the largest um, group of kids actually don't own smartphones yet. Um, so there are definitely more kids in this um, in the population that do have smartphones that have iPhones. I think it's about 30, I'm just double checking, about 38% have iPhones. Um, so there is definitely a larger proportion of kids that have iPhones, but there's still another like 37% that don't even own a phone. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. And there are some questions about the nature of that sample and if it biases from the uh, demographics of the overall sample. So to start off with, um, you mentioned that the cell phone, Android versus iOS prevalence in the population, is there a bias economic or other due to who has a phone at all and who is permitted to have a phone at young age? And I guess another relevant thing would be, is do you anticipate a bias for Android versus iOS or something like that? Yeah, so that's that's a really great question. Um, so there, in the pilot, so in those 150 kids, there was no bias. Um, so there was no like uh, racial ethnic um, differences, no socioeconomic differences, anything like that. Um, but if you do look at sort of the broader literature, um, you know, it, it's funny. So there, in general, there should be no real differences in smartphone ownership. Um, when you're looking at um, minorities or those of lower socioeconomic status. So in the broader literature, we actually know that those kids are more likely to own a smartphone um, than their sort of wealthier, whiter counterparts. Um, and there, there are a number of, of reasons for that. Um, one of which I'll just touch, touch on really briefly is because those kids' parents are more likely to work and less likely to be able to monitor their activities. So for those kids, having a smartphone um, gives them a way for their parents to get in touch with them, um, but also um, they're less likely to engage in sort of after school activities. So they're more likely to be using technology more. Um, so I actually don't think that there will be a huge bias even moving forward in, in terms of those who have smartphones and those who don't based on like socioeconomic status or racial or ethnic background. Um, and then in terms of the iPhone versus the Android. Um, so there may be a slight bias. Uh, so um, youth that, that are of um, like higher socioeconomic status are more likely to own iPhones um, than they are Android. So we may see some bias in terms of the data that we're collecting um, further down the line. Okay, and um, it just occurred to me this wasn't written, but what about the uh, spatial organization of where the participants are distributed through, through across the different sites? Like, is it kind of a uniform distribution or not? Um, you, you mean in terms of the different, like the, the ABCD, the 20 plus ABCD sites? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we will see. So for the pilot, um, the three sites were like, it was one West Coast, one Midwest, 
sort of one middle of the country, one east coast. Um, and they were able to sort of recruit uniformly across the three three sites, even though one site was um, was more like around a big city and the other two were a little bit less urban. Um, and so I, I don't know that, I don't think that there'll be very many variations in terms of being able to root, recruit kids. I do know at the LIBER site, um, the Laureate Institute for Brain Research, the majority of their kids had um, Android phones and they tended to see sort of lower SES um, kids. Okay, cool. Thank you. I don't want to exhaust you too too early in this, so I'm going to jump over to a reprint question. So in your lecture, Yark, you said that Reaper Man works nicely with everything in that is in data led. Everything, sorry, works nicely when everything is in data led. Does this mean that I must jump whole hog into using data lab? Um, this person says they think they heard use it or don't use. There is no try. It seems like a high bar with a series of gotchas. Is there a way to wade in slowly? Yes, you can. Uh, if you check for orchestrators, which are available in the Reprimand, there is also plain orchestrator. And the orchestrator is the one which transfers data pretty much back and forth. So you could just use plain and there will be there should be no need of data lab and it should work. <laughs> but you might be one of the few who uses it that way and as always issues might appear and we are welcome bug reports and pull requests if you see how it could be mitigated but in principle you could try it out without data lab but you would recommend jumping whole hog though if as a best practice uh, depending on how whole hog is defined but uh, i would really recommend yes uh, trying to use data lab. Okay, thanks. Um, on that note, let's see. This one I was just, I guess briefly, I probably should have asked this two weeks ago, but should people be using uh, Gnode infrastructure with data lab? Does it add anything above and beyond using data, data lab alone? Uh, Gnode, you mean Gin, probably. So Gnode created a portal actually under the same line of funding. It was CRCNS project, which established Gin at Gnode.com, or uh, I've forgotten the, the last letter. And the curious part is that they chose the same technology which we use underneath for data management, which is Git Annex. So now we end up with two seemingly competitive projects, right? It's one of them is Jin, another one is Data Lab. But actually they're complementary. So with Data Lab, we are not providing any hosting, right? We are providing a tool which can interface to many hosting platforms and to host, let's say, Git repositories. As you know, you use typically GitHub uh, to host data. It could reside on, in the cloud, on OSF, in Figshare, or you could use Gnode because Gnode provides you GitHub clone with Git Annex underneath it. They also provide you Gin client, which is if you don't want to use Git Git Annex data lab, then you could use just that client, which will upload the data and then it will be placed into Git Annex. But you could just natively work with Gin using data lab and handbook has a section, uh, data lab handbook has a section about that. So I would recommend to keep your data safe, you better distribute it into as many locations as possible. Let's say in my case, also back up into Dropbox and um, Gene allow, gives you that if your data fits in there and doesn't violate their terms of condition that you bring that site down with your first upload, <laughs> right? Then you're most welcome to use it with or without data. All right. And next question, I'd be interested to hear uh, obviously what Yark has to say, but also if Dave or any of the other Reapernum uh, people have anything to add to this. What considerations should I be aware of when using Reaperman and the Reaperman ecosystem more broadly to manage small versus large data sets 
and locally acquired versus publicly available data sets? Is the ecosystem more suited for one use case over another? I could start answering. <laughs> Why don't you start uh, and I'll see. Ooh, there is many dimensions uh, embedded in that question, right? Um, and Reaperman is just yet another tool, which development of which spawn off many other small tools. And that's what I mentioned in my talk that we saw that it might fit better or be of better value instead of creating one big thing, right? Create little things which might be applicable to different, let's say, different scales or to different types of data. Right, so Reaperman ecosystem provides you tools which go across the whole spectrum. In some cases, they must be might be better fit, and some might be not the ideal fit. I don't know. Right? Let's say Reaperman. If you take Reaperman and you want to process some data which you don't have locally, it's public. It's publicly in the cloud, right? And you don't want even to download the data, right? But if it's available in data led data set, you just could compile your study data set, which would have all unambiguous links to what kind of data, where to get the data, which version of the data, how do you run it, with what container, without downloading any of those. You don't need to download data, you don't need to download container, you just have those data led data sets, which know how to download them. And then you submit your job into the cloud. It does the analysis, it fetches all the data, and you fetch only your derivative result, which might be statistical map, which is small, right? And that was use case toward which Reaperman indeed was geared toward. Uh, another use case, which was geared toward, you have access to high performance computing cluster, uh, maybe multiple of them, and they all use different batch systems. Right, so how to submit jobs, and you find it somewhat cumbersome to create those scripts. That's where you might not even use data lab, you just use Reaperman uh, to just submit the jobs, right? And then if you don't use data lab, it's just you don't have this clean uh, history of changes, right? But again, it's yet another tool, yet another, uh, yet another use case, right? The same tool. Uh, if you take go back to the first steps within Reprenim system, QDConf conversion of the data, Reprenim, right? That is applicable to small studies and huge ones, right? You better actually apply it to huge ones because then you have consistent standardization across sites, let's say, right? So, and then you might not even care about Reprenim at all at that point because your site provides you infrastructure for processing. Right. So again, these modules now are reusable without necessarily using all of the Reprenium for your project. I hope that addresses that question. Yeah, and from my point of view, again, that was better than I could do. The point being that, you know, again, we need different tools for different situations and Reprenium's goal is to cover all the things from local data to shared data, from small local data to big local data and give you the most convenient and make it as efficient as possible to get the data, to process the data, and to keep that provenance trail attached to it, regardless of if it's small, big, local, or, or public. All right, cool, thank you. Um, I think I'm gonna jump back over to ABCD. There are a couple questions about uh, the data that you presented, uh, the acquisition methods, and how they will be affected or how you can look at COVID related things from them. So thank you so much for the wonderful lectures. I'm wondering how to differentiate the effects or changes due to development and the uses of usage of social media or health related measures, including sleep patterns and sedentary versus active activity from changes due to COVID. Mm -hmm. I guess it's relevant to all of us. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so um, I can talk about the physical activity and sedentary portion first. Um, so essentially the kids that had Fitbits at the start of, of COVID, when everything started to shut down, those kids will have, were asked to continue to wear their Fitbit even um, beyond sort of the, the protocol stop time. Um, so for those kids, 
that like back in March of last year, um, it's actually those kids will will provide really nice data on like pre post or, or yeah pre COVID and then like the start of COVID um, and sort of changes in physical activity and sedentary um, behavior. So I know that a lot of the sites, I'm not sure about all the sites, but I know a lot of the sites were not allowed to have like RAs and things go in to collect Fitbit devices um, uh, from participants, nor send out new devices to participants, even if it was their time um, to start collecting that type of data. Um, so the Fitbit data over this period of COVID maybe look a little bit different um, than the Fitbit data should. Um, and um, due to the protocol. Um, but the kids that were wearing Fitbit back in March of last year should have some nice pre-post data to see changes in um, physical activity and sedentary behavior. You can then look at the other data that was collected at that time, the behavioral data to look at sort of change, how that affected changes in sort of other areas of life. Um, I think it is a little bit site dependent about during COVID. So COVID has, has and is going on forever. <laughs> um, and so in terms of like um, later in COVID, maybe like later 2020 and now into 2021, um, I, I, I don't know that there's going to be data to compare for those kids for, for now um, and last year. Um, it's, it, it has been really, it's been sort of site dependent. Um, so, so that may be tough, but you may be able to look at subsamples of the overall ABCD population to, to be able to look at sort of COVID related um, activity and sleep. And then Dustin, remind me about the other part of that question, just so I don't pay it short shrift. Give me just a second to- Sure, yeah. While he's doing that, let me jump in and say, I think Kara's most recent point about the subsample is one that's particularly salient. And this is what we've run into already with the IRMA substudy is that we had a distinct event that occurred and some participants we had really amazing pre-data on um, and some we had relative post-data on. So it really sort of depends on the timing of the research question. Um, and, and with COVID, I anticipate, we are gonna be able to use subsamples to really dig into is this an acute effect of COVID for, for those kids where we were, they, they were wearing their Fitbits actually during the first shutdown and when there was this tremendous upheaval. Um, and then we're gonna be able to ask more chronic questions for um, the sites where we've been able to, to, to continue the kids through their protocols. And, and, you know, I mean, I always think about my kids in particular, they are clear, clearly still having COVID related impacts on their social um, well being and their mental health. So I think there's going to be a lot of different types of questions that we can ask, simply because of the diversity of the participants experiences with data collection during this past year. Um, and, and also uh, just the, the vast number of, of participants that we have across the whole consortium. Yeah, and so, Cara, the question, I, th I think you've basically answered it. Uh, okay. So Good. they were, I mean, the, the, it strikes me as a really difficult uh, endeavor to try to differentiate, as the question writes, differentiate the effects or changes due to development um, from the diff the changes due to COVID. I mean, because the development is happening for, the, for these specific subjects, the development is happening with COVID and you can't yes. really disentangle them, so. Uh, but I'm glad that you are explicitly asking them to continue to wear the Fitbit because I, for one, have not been wearing my activity tracker because what's the point? Yeah, it makes me sad. Yeah. <laughs> it. it makes me sad. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's uh, stay on Fitbit data for a second. Um, I understand correctly the uh, Fitbit summary data is what is made available. Is there plans for complete raw data? so that alternate summaries could be considered? So um, there are no plans to make the raw data just sort of widely available in the way that the rest of the ABC data is made available. Um, it is a lot of data. So Fitbit um, samples at like the second level. Mm -hmm. um, so if you think about hypothetically, if 12,000 kids were wearing Fitbit, even for just three weeks, and they were sampling it every, every single second of every single day over 21 days, that is a ton of data. Um, and most people won't um, want to use it at that sort of level. Um, 
And a lot of clinical questions like moving from second to second um, within any given day typically is not, um, doesn't give you much like, doesn't have much clinical utility. Um, so there really are no plans to release all the raw data. However, if, if you do wanna use the raw data to be able to look at sort of more fine grained interactions, um, then it's available. And Angie, you may know more about how to get um, access to that data, but I think you have to request it from uh, the DAIC to be able to get um, the raw data. Yeah, I, I think it's a separate procedure, but I don't know much more than that. So I, okay. I, I believe it's requesting it through the DA, DAIC, um, uh, but it, it is available to be distributed. It's just a separate process. Okay. Yeah, then we had another question about how to go about accessing the minute, la minute level data. So, um, okay. Yeah, on a different, well, okay, staying with the Fitbit, Briefly, here's a quick question. So I know participants' activity is tracked uh, with the Fitbit Charge 2, but presumably newer devices are going to come out over the next few years. Is there a plan or timeline for providing new devices to participants? Uh, will new devices be piloted first? Yeah, so that's that's a another great, all great questions, all very great questions. Um, so that's a really great question, and that's something we struggled with moving from the, the pilot um, to sort of generalizing the Fitbit to the entire um, ABCD cohort. So in the pilot, we used the Fitbit charge. Um, and then in moving now to, to distributing it amongst the cohort, um, the charge two came out sort of at the end of the pilot. And so then we just sort of moved to the next, um, uh, the newest device. Um, and so we we 100% anticipate that this is going to continue to happen. Technology um, develops very quickly, advances are made very quickly, um, certainly much faster than research occurs. Um, and so, you know, so we will roll out likely the newest version of the device when it comes out um, or sometime in the future. Um, but fundamentally like what the device is collecting will not change right so we're looking at sleep we're looking at physical activity and breaking that down in a number of different ways um so the data itself is really is sort of independent of the device um it's the same type of data we're getting the same measurements um so even as sort of newer more updated versions of fitbit and other things come out then then yes we will probably abcd will probably move to those things um but the, the data being collected won't, won't be much different. And presumably the device model is going to be in the data somewhere so that we can control for it or look at the effects or anything like that. Yes. All right, uh, another question on this, on this topic. If you're only collecting data for a certain period of time, this is with about the Fitbit. If you're only okay. collecting data for a certain period of time, then do you think that the participant uh, will increase their activity during the Fitbit measurement period because they know their data is being collected? Yes. So that's that. Oh, so many great questions. That's a great question. Um, so in, I can tell you from the pilot data, right? So those 150, um, we, we had them wear the Fitbit, obviously, and then we also had them um, complete a questionnaire pre-post um, the wear time. And, you know, Subjectively, parents said because the kids were wearing the Fitbit, they told they encouraged their kids to be more active. Um, subjectively, the kids also reported that since they were wearing the Fitbit, they also felt like they should be more active. When we looked at the objective Fitbit data, no change in activity or sleep um, at all. Um, there was like a slight decrease in activity, actually in like moderate to vigorous physical activity, a slight decrease in boys. Um, so it actually even though subjectively they feel like it, it, it changed their activity and sleep, it actually did not. Um, and so other studies that have used um, these like uh, wearable devices in like child and adolescent populations um, sometimes see like a short-term change in activity, um, but past like a week or two, um, it sort of returns to baseline. Um, so based on sort of those other studies, as well as like our pilot data, I actually don't think that these there's going to be much change um, in behaviors just based on wearing the Fitbit. Well, that's, that's interesting. I wouldn't expect that. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm going to jump over to ReaperNim now. And Yurik, we have a couple questions about uh, using containers. So let's see. How about this one first? If I'm working with a new tool that comes in a singularity container, is there a recommended way to interact with the container to debug and understand to debug and then how to understand how I should build the command I eventually want to run on my data lab data set? Um, well, if it's, let's say if it was BitZap, right? If that tool is ripped into BitZap, which has unified interface, then there is a guarantee that dash dash help gives you options to use, right? And it conforms to regular bits app uh, expected interface, right? Do you work across participants? Do you do group analysis? What is participant label, right? If it's just arbitrary tool wrapped into a container, container is not a savior here, right? Um, you would need to figure out how to use that tool. And hopefully that tool was specified as the entry point within the container, right? So containers, they typically have entry point, which is typically that script or tool, which is primary purpose of having that container. Like Beats apps, they will have their entry point. Um, Hudiconf container, I think, also has Hudiconf as the entry point. If there is such an entry point and you see difficulty, let's say it doesn't provide you dash dash help and you want to really look inside of it. If it's singularity container, you could use instead of singularity run this container, you could use singularity exec this container bash. And then you'll end up inside the container, but in interactive session. So you could introspect inside, oh, you know, where is that tool? Uh, what other components are installed inside the container. And the same with Docker, you could use Docker and specify entry point equal bash, which will override the entry point. But in general, again, container is not a panacea and many ways to make a not conveniently usable one. So it matters which tool is wrapped and either it has documentation which comes with it, how to use it. And container is just a helper. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that containers are great, obviously, for reproducibility, but in some ways it almost exacerbates a little bit the black box issue because uh, it's even harder to kind of interact with the, the internal workings of it. Yeah, um, it puts a black box inside that black box, right? And two blacks don't make it white. So uh, it makes it a little bit like that. Yeah. Uh, on the same note, uh, can just anyone add any old container to ReproNim containers? Is there a search, search and discovery on existing containers? I just want one with FreeSurfer 9.2, which I don't think exists. Can I just reuse one that's already there? Good question. Uh, at the moment, there is no search facility. And uh, what we want to achieve is to do extract metadata describing those containers and which would provide them information about which components are inside. Uh, that makes it a little bit tricky though. Some containers could be minimized. Let's say if I am doing fMRI prep container, I don't need all of the free surfer, right? I would need only parts which I might create uh, trace and extract using ReproZip, which will minimize my container so it makes it uh, easier to distribute. And then if I decide, oh, I know fMRI prep that such and such version uses free surfer such and such, it doesn't mean that you can take that container and use free surfer inside for a different purpose. It's not necessarily, it, it wouldn't guarantee to work. Let's put it this way, right? If it was anyhow minimized, but discovery of which components are inside the containers, that that's a good topic adding older container if it exists somewhere. Yeah, sure, just file an issue. I'll, I'll look into it and we'll add it uh, for posterity if somebody needs to reproduce results with older free surfer. I might not create my own container, although that might be also possible, be possible with NeuroDocker. So we could look into that. Um, and as I mentioned, many developments are demand driven. So if you need one, 
file an issue or make a contribution and we will make it solved. I guess my related question to that then is, well, on the one hand, I love NeuroDocker, of course, but there's a finite number of combinations of things you can build with NeuroDocker. Should all those containers just be built and stuffed in, in uh, reprinim containers and then you just pull the existing container you want instead of doing the build from NeuroDocker? I don't know if that's any sense. It's just a question that popped into my head while you were saying that. I guess demand driven, demand driven, right? So if there is demand, then there could be dedicated container. Otherwise, yes, uh, creating your own one and placing it also under data net control uh, is the way forward. It would seem that uh, NeuroDocker gets very often used to build identical containers. A bunch of people, you know, make you know the most recent FSO. Well, probably a thousand people have now done that. And is there an efficiency or not? Yeah. Anyway, thank you. All right, so we have just a few more questions left, but a little bit more time. So if anyone who's watching has any more, please put in the question Q&A. Um, I'm gonna go back over to ABCD questions. So Dr. Baggett's lecture and her paper mentioned geolocation using GPS on subject smartphones, but these data are not discussed in any more detail. Can you elaborate on what geolocation data are or will be available? Yeah. So. Currently, there, there are no geolocation data available. Um, you know, in the in the paper and sort of um, within the the novel technology work group, we have a little dis we have a lot of discussions about like the capabilities, right? What we're capable of, what kind of data we're capable of getting um, from smartphones, and and how that it can inform sort of the science and the like brain behavior relationships that we're interested in looking at. Um, we have to be very careful uh, about getting like location data from kids, adults, whoever, from from people that are involved in research, um, because it can identify them. It could be identifying, um, but also um, it can link people to like criminal activity and a lot of other things. Um, so it's not something that we're collecting now. It's something we've discussed, especially now that we have the Ears app and things can be added on to the Ears app. Um, but it has to be done in a really thoughtful thoughtful way um, and we're just not there yet. Okay, thanks. And I guess I should have asked this question when we were talking about the pandemic, but yeah. this person wants to know, have you used the fitness screen or media data collected to research anything related to the pandemic? Uh, so me personally, no, um, I have not. Um, I am I'm, I'm sure there must be people out there that are looking at that that data. I personally have not looked at that data. Um, so I, I I can't really speak to like sort of the COVID related changes. Um, again, I think the sites that are able to continue um, with the protocol and like administering things remotely or in person, if that's happening, um, are doing it and it will be, and you will be able to hopefully pull out some relationships um, with screen time and activity and all of that and and the pandemic, but I personally haven't looked at any of that. Okay. Yep, and friendly reminder, we do have a COVID sub-study that is collecting data right now. And my understanding is that there are a number of different questions, particularly those related to um, virtual and remote school that will have some overlap with, with these data. Um, and so that we can use that to try and parse out um, some of the COVID related effects on the activity, on the actigraphy data. Um, I also kind of want to take a moment and, and pull back here and acknowledge the many challenges that the neuro novel technologies work group faces. Um, you know, this discussion is, is a lot different than some of our discussions. Um, data like neurocognitive assessments and um, even imaging measures, we're, we're relying on basically decades of prior research and validated methods. Um, things like Fitbit and actigraphy and screen time assessments, we don't really have that same sort of foundation. So a lot of work that's been done by this work group is really charting new frontiers here in, in how we assess kids in this way. Um, I noted that Carl's lecture mentioned multiple times how often they need to re revise the questions that they're asking, revise the specific ample examples that are given. Um, so while I feel it, that this part of the protocol is really robust and really gets into a good level of depth, 
I also think about how sneaky kids are and how there's so many individual uh, differences in, in, in how they handle their screen time. And, you know, just because I'm a mom, I think about how my own kids screen time isn't really captured by these questions. Um, kids haven't, they change really fast and as fast as the new platforms for sure. Uh, for example, I noticed that Discord is listed as a communication tool, you know, but when I talk to my kids, they spend all of their time on Discord and that's their primary platform for social interaction. So these ideas of like social media um, versus communication, there's a complicated sort of series of effects here that folks will need to really disentangle to understand how much time their kids are interacting with other kids. Um, so I, I did just want to acknowledge the really long series of complications that uh, we face here in trying to um, dig into these data and get knowledge out of them. Um, it's tough and COVID is only making it harder. Thank you for that, Angie. <laughs> that was that was very helpful. And 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 just a note. Uh, sorry, if I have the time. A couple a couple of notes on that. So um, so like Angie said, yes, the COVID like sub study is running. A number of the screen time questions in the COVID sub study were pulled directly from the like uh, screen time questionnaire that is used in general in ABCD. So you will be able to look at sort of comparisons um, between. COVID times and, and other times, because um, some of the questions are exactly the same. Um, and, and it is a constantly changing landscape. Um, you know, and so I think that supplementing the screen time questionnaire with this new like ears app is actually a really good way to like address some of the problems that Angie brought up, right? That like her kids use Discord as like a social networking tool, but we, we talk about it in the questionnaire as a communication tool. So the ways that ears data is collected is not only are we collecting data on like the apps that kids are using on their obviously just Android smartphones, um, but we're also com compiling them into composites, right? But a lot of the composite scores like, um, or co the composite groups like social media or communication or video gaming also overlap because we realize and recognize that a lot of these kids are using these apps and maybe the ways, in ways that we as adults are, are using them or, or aren't using them um, and maybe using them in ways that that wasn't like initially prescribed to be done that way. Um, so supplementing like the screen exposure questionnaire, like subjective questions with the objective ears data will help to sort of clarify some of that murkiness as well. And simultaneous use, right? Having Roblox yes. up, having Zoom up yes. and having your chat window up, like all of these things are all happening at once. God yes. bless them. Yeah, so, you know, and we capture some of that simultaneous use. So we, we've noticed like in earlier, um, in like the baseline and like the year two questionnaires that kids were reporting like when you add it up, like individual use, they would be reporting, they would end up reporting like 60 hours a day of, of use, right? Because they're simultaneously using a lot of these devices, right? I wish I had 60 hours a day to like get things done. Um, so. So you're right. So we realized that the questionnaire actually wasn't accurately reflecting what's going on with these kids, right? That they are really simultaneously using a bunch of different devices, a bunch of different technologies um, and so on. Yes. Sorry, Dustin, you've tried to cut me off several times. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, it, it's okay. <laughs> um, something that Angie said reminded me of a question that I had while watching your lecture. Um, so watching your lecture and looking at the, the apps that you're tracking for screen time, it made me feel really old because some of them I hadn't heard about. And I'm wondering at what threshold um, like a new app gets put into a new category. Like, are you asking kids about, it's probably not reasonable for you as a person to keep track of all of the new apps. And so are you asking kids what they're spending their time on? What are the new trends that the kids are doing these days? Um, so we aren't. So before the ears app, there were focus groups that asked kids. Um, there were a few focus groups that asked kids um, about their use and like what apps they're using, like what music apps, for example, they're using and things like that. Um, you know, we're pulling the composite scores from the Google Play Store. So Google Play is really informing um, our knowledge about what kids are doing. Um, and so, of course, everyone uses Google Play. So it's going to be across like 
um, young kids, older kids, adolescents, uh, young adults, adults, like older people. Um, so it's not gonna be a 100% accurate reflection of what like the youth are doing, um, but Google Play gives us an idea of like what apps are the most popular. Okay, cool. And we have one more question about ABCD in the yep. Q&A. Sure. So can we compare the days when children went to school with the days that they didn't? Yes, so that's a great question. Um, so initially, no, um, because we hadn't thought about <laughs> hadn't thought about that um, when we piloted it. Um, but we realized that it that it's really important, right? Like on the maybe a little bit different during COVID, um, but in normal times, weekend weekends look a lot different than weekdays um, for a lot of kids, and so. Um, it should be asked in the in in the questionnaire whether or not you were wearing um, you were wearing Fitbit um, on week weekends versus oh you know what sorry so it's not even asked so we when you um, when the Fitbit sent out the date is collected that it's sent out and the date that it get comes back is collected so you can see how many weekends and weekdays are included in Fitbit same thing with ears so we. Um, so they note the date that the ears app was downloaded to the smartphone um so like let's say today is who knows what today is it's uh, friday february 5th so you would note that today i got the fitbit and 21 days later i sent it back or 21 days later i stopped um collecting ears data and so based on that like time span um you should be able to see uh weekend weekday um I think at one point we talked about asking about like school breaks as well, because that's something else. Like if you're on holiday or you're on a break from school, and I'm I'm not 100% sure that that was incorporated into the like pre post questionnaire um, for the Fitbit and the ears, um, but it is something that we discussed. I'm not sure, Angie, if you know better about like holidays. Um, so I, that is something we discussed. And so I think it is in the pre post questionnaire is like if you got the Fitbit or if you had the ears app during like a school holiday or, or some other time where you wouldn't be in school and likely your like screen time exposure would be up maybe. Okay, and the, the weekday versus weekend makes a lot of sense, but I guess there's probably not a way to know whether it was a weekday and the kid did not go to school or something like that. Yeah, not during COVID, you know, like my kids are home most of the time, um, not going to school, the school keeps getting shut down. Um, but there's no, no one's recording like um, the days that kids are not in school during COVID. So COVID is going to upend that a little bit. Yeah. All right. And Yark, final question is for you. Is there an Ask Yoda resource covering frequently asked, asked questions? I don't remember how much Yoda was asked in the movie. Uh, that could have been a resource, but you would need to mine it. Um, Neurostars would be probably a good venue uh, for any related questions to neuroimaging for which you didn't find immediately a better venue. And there, even if you search for Yoda now on Neurostars, you'll find some posts which either explicitly ask about Yoda or mention Yoda in the replies either how frequently asked, you will see from the votes, and uh, if you upvote, they will become judged as more frequently asked. If there is a large enough demand from the community, will you build a Yoda bot for people to ask? Yoda bot, that would be nice, and it shouldn't be actually too much work, right? If, if there is enough questions and answers, good answers, then we should do it. All right, thank you. So that's all the questions that we had in the Q&A. Um, I don't know if anyone has any last thoughts. No specific last thoughts, but to yet again, thank you know, our speakers and our presenters. Uh, we can't do this without you. And thank you for taking the time to do the lectures and to be here to answer questions. And um, if other questions come up from, from the class or the other folks, we will certainly share them with you. And uh, try to get more feedback as needed. But again, thank you so much for participating. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.